get started. Um, there are still people going to be filtering in, I think, as they get through security. Um, sessions are video, though, so they will be able to see it. Um, so this morning, we've got unique perspectives from the Civic Tech coalface. Um, it's always nice to be chairing a session I probably want to be at anyway. Um, and first of all, we've got Isabel Ho. Yes. Uh, giving us the legal story of GovZero. Yes. Okay, good morning everyone. I'm Isabel from Taiwan. Thanks. Thank you to be here for in such an early morning. Um, I'm glad to be here to share my thoughts about uh, some legal experiments we did in GovZero, which I think enabled the growth of the civic technology community. Uh, I'm a lawyer focusing on technology and working with internet startups and NGOs in Taiwan. In 2000, I started working with people from open source community. And um, uh, I, I am also a participant of God Zero since the first hackathon in 2012. Today, I want to share the story of God Zero from a lawyer's per perspective. In God Zero, the participants are always trying to find new ways to get things done, even in the legal arrangements. What I want to talk about is what we have, what have it happened in the past six years. It's a process of, of uh, evalu uh, evaluation. The reason I start thinking about what I'm going to share today uh, is because of a question I, I was uh, asked by a lady in uh, OGP summit uh, in Georgia last summer. That is the first time uh, I'm, th that is the first time I attended an international conference um, as a participant of God Zero. I met this lady from a Mongolia NGO which do CVTAC projects there. And I give her this name card just the one you see. And uh, when she saw the logo, she said, I know this. And then she said, what is it? I'm kind of surprised because she, she can recognize the logo some way. OK, at this some way. And at the same time, her question beats me. What is it? What is GovZero? Uh, does anyone of you never heard about hear about Gov Zero before this presentation? Okay, okay. Then you can scan the barcode there, and <laughs> that that will link to our web page. Okay. Um, Um, the Gov Zero starts in uh, 2012. It was a hack song uh, at first. In the past six and seven years, Gov Zero evolves organically because more and more participants getting involved. Today, there are there have been uh, 34 hack songs, three international conferences. Some of you were there in Taiwan with us last November and the five, five, more than 500 proposals and the, the more than 300 uh, kongju, which is uh, uh, someone who hosts a project, which we, we speak uh, kong in Chinese. There have been more than 3,000 contributors, but there are only, these are only numbers. From a point of view, from the point of um, a lawyer, what is uh, zero? What is it? Um, because so many things have been done in Gov Zero, like so many conferences and hackathons. In some people's mind, uh, they will think Gov Zero is a well organized, just like uh, this image. But uh, there are people in the ground and gods in the heaven, and and uh, uh, because some uh, the fir at the first. The idea of God Zero is to fork in government. So someone might think um, God Zero is like this. This is a, a central government structure of Taiwan. 
and uh, so there are bu uh, bureaus and the department of different functions. But no, it is not like that. Gavdiro is more like this. <laughs> <laughs> there are people gather, gather during the weekends. Um, and um, don't really know what to do or what is going to happen. It is what God Zero looks like at the very first hexagon, and it is what God Zero looks like today. Only it is a little bit more complicated. It is some somehow in some way organized. Oh, okay. First of all, I want to make it clear. GovZero is not a legal entity. It is not a company. It is not, it is not a foundation. It is not an association. So what is GovZero? What does GovZero have? Uh, there are citizens who become contributors. There are documents on HackPad and the HackMD for the collaboration for, from remote. There, there are code in GitHubs. After six years, GovZero has an approach of collaboration. And uh, GovZero is a network to connect citizens of different backgrounds. Um, the contributors can be programmers, designers, activists, NGO members, public servants, lawyers, and uh, et cetera. So what is the uh, environment which allowed GovZero to survive and evolve during the past six years? What are the essential legal elements which helped forcing God Zero? Uh, the essential legal elements. <laughs> okay, this is my, my colleagues. <laughs> uh, I think it is a creative common license, open source license, open data. And um, these are legal instruments enable co collaboration. These are legal instruments to empower citizens to take actions to make change. Though I think open source and the Creative Commons license are really important. Um, as I, I was in, uh, uh, okay. Next, next I want to talk about how GovDigo works from three different parts. First is participants, organization and the collaboration. Participants. Okay, the famous quote of God Zero is "Ask not why nobody is doing th this. You are the nobody." We often say nobody cares about. It's kind of passive. It's only complain, complain. But if you are nobody, just like Diddy Cat, <laughs> that makes huge change. Diddy Cat is nobody. Titty cats about a lot of things, and the titty cats make huge changes. So that's uh, participants. Everybody can be nobody. Even a six-year-old boy can be nobody. Um, when my son was learning uh, phonetics, he proposed to use Mongdian, the dictionary uh, by Oji Tong, to make a Mongdian uh, phonetic terrorist game. And um, uh, it, he proposed this proposal, and in two weeks, he got the game. And the ideas inspire ideas. There is Chinese vocabulary terrorist game after that. And I, <laughs> I'm so glad it still works well after six years. Okay, So everybody can be nobody. There is no membership no uh, qualification to become nobody. This is the easy part. And then I will talk about organizations. It's just uh, what I said. Um, uh, the first year hackathon is like this. But after six years, it's more like this. We have different um, tax force in the GAP zero. So we have this food supply tax force, which is very important because we p provide pizza during hack zone. So people will come and uh, enjoy the food and the drinks and the talk and the program together every two months. So this is a very important part, maybe the 
the most important part. Okay, and then we have uh, the uh, different task force like OCF actually is one of the uh, country which uh, host uh, the Gulf Zero News. And we have the Taiwan, which is famous in internationally, um, and uh, so on. So um, in this uh, different task force, actually they have their own um, governance model. Uh, there are three different governance models. The first one is open to everyone, like uh, Gabriel Haxon, the Grand Haxon, and the COVAX, which is a plan to fact to do fact check. And uh, also there are um, some tax force, like you need to get the um, uh, a vote, vote, yes votes from current members, like Gov Zero Talk. And when we are got an invitation for a talk or an interview, then uh, the tax force will try to arrange things. And uh, also there are some um, task force was um, is uh, by invitation only, like Zhou Song. Zhou Song is a task force who host the um, Hackson every two months, and also do the grant. Uh, we have a civic tech grant program. Um, then we'll talk about uh, collaborations. Um, it seems a very loose community, um, but we do have some rules. Uh, we think to do things. Uh, we have the Gov Zero manifesto, we have code of conduct during the hackathon, and we have this uh, Gov Zero domain registration rules. So some of them are binding, some of, them, some of these rules are not. But these rules are discussed openly on Hackpad. So uh, people should follow that. Should follow there if they recognize themselves as uh, Gov Zero pa participants. Okay. So this is a manufacture manifesto of Gov Zero. It's simple and uh, clear. And I think after six years we need another version. So may I may propose another um, draft of the manifesto because things change a lot. So what are decisions in the legal respect that Gov Zero founders have made in the early stages? What well, these dis decisions affect the shaping of Gov Zero? First, they decide not to register as a legal entity because at first it costs too much for us. We are volunteers, so there is no entity. And no memberships, so we just held a hack zone for people to come. Okay, and no Gov Zero trademarks. And the uh, licensing under this Creative Commons or open source license is not compulsory. So you can even use proprietary, propose a proprietary project, but just people may not join your project. So, um, but actually in some tax force, um, In some tax force, uh, the country, the host, do have uh, set up extra rules uh, because country can decide how to run their own tax force. So I was a member of a tax force called the uh, Zhou So I'm going to share about um, Zhou Song's uh, governance and, um, and experience. Zhou Song is a task force organized grant hackathons every two months as well as three tech grant program, program. The program is trying to support the project in Gov Zero to sustain because we have so many proposals, but most of them I died um, not keep alive after hackathons because people are volunteer tears. But it, um, it, but it also opens up for application to projects outside Gov Zero. We'll find eventually these projects were included in, Gov, in the Gov Zero community. They get more support other than just the funding, such, such as um, um, mentor connection, early feedbacks. In past two years, there are more than 
200 proposals and 24 grants. The funds amounting to 300,000 euros. And the, these are JOSO members to raise the money. And actually, Diddy Katz uh, was in charge of the program in the past two, two years. So Diddy Katz, the nobody, did really huge change. OK? So how, but we have the inf enforcement rule of got zero grant because we are giving out money. So we have extra, uh, extra rules for these grantees. First is to be consistent with Gap Zero Manifesto. And second, they, uh, it to be, needs to be licensed under uh, open source licenses. So it also needs to meet the freedom defined definition of a free cultural works. Okay. So uh, that's what I share about Gap Zero. And uh, also, I want to share something about um, what Gov Zero affects the um, statutes uh, in Taiwan. This is a, a public donation, open data for us. It's in PDF uh, format. It's just uh, horrible to us <laughs> because you don't do anything about PDF. And uh, the government said it was uh, uh, open data, OK? So there are hackers, uh, contributors in Gov Zero. They try to digitalize all political contribution data. They just uh, uh, print out the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the PDF files and take it into small columns. And, uh, in, and uh, they call the people from, um, they put it on the web website. And the people can just input the numbers, so it will digitalize, digitalize all the data uh, together. And um, so this is what we do in uh, 2014. And uh, after four years, um, the government uh, decided to change, the, uh, to amend the statute. So maybe in next year, we can see a real digitalized uh, donation data now. So uh, that's what, so it uh, affects um, uh, the statute also. So uh, that's what I'm going to share today. So thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel, and welcome to everybody who's just joined us. Um, the talks are being recorded, so if you, if you really wanted to see that and couldn't get in, um, they'll be on YouTube shortly after the event. Um, next, I'd like to welcome Matthew from My Society to talk about when civic tech matures. Uh, we'll do questions at the end, but due to the late start, we might not have quite as much time. Um, but I'm, I'm sure the speakers, if, if you don't get to it, we'll be happy for you to um, ask a question when the breaks. Hi, I'm Matthew Zumbel. As um, Martin said, I'm from my society and I'm going to be talking about um, some of the unique issues that arise in running projects for quite some time. Um, so my society has been around in its current form for um, 15, 16 years um, and I've been with it for 15 of those years this year. So um, so we know quite some time. Um, so I'm just going to run through some of the projects I'm going to sort of talk about um, and how long they've been around and then go into some of the details about the issues. Um, so uh, our first project was launched in early 2005, um, it's called Write to Them. Um, it's a contact your representative site where you can send messages to your local councillors, um, up to your national representatives and members of the House of Lords. Um, it built upon the work of previous things, Factory MP um, and Stand, which date back to 1998 and Fundamentally, it hasn't, hasn't changed a lot since then, <laughs> and that's still running now. Um, in the same year, so 2005, we launched two other websites, Pledge Bank um, was a collective action, um, uh, yeah, sort of a collective action website, um, and Here for MP was a constituency-based mailing list um, for MPs to talk to their constituents, um, and both those closed in 2015, so they had a 10-year run. Um, they Work For You started in 2004, 
um, but was not a MySight project to begin with, but was brought in house in 2006 when we also started running the petitions website for the British Prime Minister for, for number 10, uh, which we ran until the 2010 general election. <laughs> um, Fix My Street um, was launched in 2007 um, as a national street reporting um, service, um, and that's still running now, as is What Do They Know, which is our national, the UK's national freedom of information requesting site. Um, and then lastly, MapIt um, is our sort of internal postcode lookup tool, um, which we, was one of the first things I wrote because right to them need a postcode lookup tool to map your post, to map your address to your representative. Um, but it was an internal until our National Mapping Agency Ordnance Survey uh, released the data as open data um, in 2010. So with all of these and all our other projects, um, we do our best to automate them and make it as self-sufficient as possible, but you can't automate everything. Um, no matter how small um, or self-sufficient you can be, you've got to, there'll be investment in terms of updating, uh, maintenance and user support. Um, so first there are the issues that can make you feel a bit like the Red Queen. I don't know how many people read Alice through the Looking Glass, but the, the Red Queen runs very fast in order to get nowhere at all. And if you want to get somewhere else, you have to run twice as fast. Um, and running a website for a long time can feel a lot like that. Um, there's just the general maintenance of updates, the framework you write your project in might, um, uh, will, well, will release updates, might stop supporting the version you're using, um, the servers you're running things on might require updating, server updates like that. Um, when right to them launched, we had a server connected to a fax machine on an unlimited fax um, plan, so because there was a lot of e MPs who didn't know about email at the time, um, and so we'd be, we would send them faxes, um, which obviously has its own lovely maintenance issues that you don't really get with uh, the internet. Um, I'm not sure how true it is now, but at the, a long time ago, working with the Facebook API um, was if you wanted to keep, if you were doing something with them, they would change it very frequently without notice, um, which made it quite difficult to work with if you wanted to keep your thing running. Um, so yeah, general maintenance like that. Um, also, people's expectations may change, um, so you might feel like you have to redesign your website in order to keep just keep it fresh and keep people using it. Um, so I think Fix My Street and Write to Them have both had one main visual um, redesign in their lifespan, whereas they were few and what do they know have had two, <coughs> Martin now because he's the designer, two, maybe three. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that's because they're more sort of, Write to Them and Fix My Street are very focused, you go there for a purpose normally, so they're maybe uh, more simple um, projects, I'm not sure, I'm some research in there. Uh, but I find that definitely designing both at the front end and the back end, um, designing progressively and for resilience definitely helps reduce the burden. Um, for example, Fix My Street has always had a photo upload so people can, um, well, I like to say we have the world's largest collection of dog poo photos. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not the sort of thing you, you think you're going to be doing in life. but. Um, <laughs> um, but um, we've always had a photo upload uh, for Fix My Street back, back to the very beginning. Um, and because we thought people might be on slow connections even back then um, uploading the photos, we always built in a, a way that if there was a, something went wrong uploading the photo, something went, the photo upload went fine, but um, something else went wrong with your submission, it would, all, it would remember the photo. Um, so you wouldn't have to re-upload it again. It would give you the form back. But it, would have, it would have stored the photo server side so that you didn't have to upload it again and save you, save you some time, which meant 10, 12 years later, when we got to the time to make the photo upload much more busy and modern with drag and drop and like, nicely working and stuff like that, that um, made the whole process much easier because that sort of server size stuff was already there. Um, Fix My Street, uh, the maps on Fix My Street have always worked without JavaScript, uh, which Google Maps can't seem to manage. Uh, so they're, they're a bit bigger than us. Um, and then with um, any long running code base, you also have technical debt, um, which if anyone doesn't know, that sort of like things that were definitely the right thing to do at the time um, are no longer, like, as things change, are no longer right, or you've got to do something, in a, you've not got as much time as you would like to do something, so you're forced to compromise on decisions. Um, example there is the number 10 petition site that we used to run, had to deal with a very high number of people um, signing petitions and getting confirmation emails at the same time. Um, so we, had to, we ended up writing our own email sending daemon um, like, uh, to be just very small and quick and not even touch the hard disk of the server it was on. Um, which was fine, brilliant, it worked fine. Um, years later we're no longer running the number 10 petition service but we still use the same code for some local councils. 
um, and the code runs fine, so it's still running, but um, there's no need, desire to change it, but there are issues if it ever goes wrong or there's just like, we need to look something up because it's a special little thing. Now there's, it's just an extra effort and stuff, so issues like that can arise. Um, so the general issues, um, the sort of can arise with any project. Um, now I'm going to talk about relying upon external data sources and how um, they could go wrong. Uh, what I'm going to call managing the flamingos. Uh, they're, all, they're all like this, so I hope I guys want them. Um, so this is going to be about They Work For You. So for anyone who doesn't know, They Work For You um, is a national parliamentary monitoring site for the UK. Um, it began as basically a scraper that scraped the HTML from the official parliament site, um, passed it into XML and then imported it into a database for display on a website. Um, the HTML that Parliament was producing was partly a manual process, still is, it's, a, it's an amazing feat they get it <laughs> together I think, um, but that also led to frequent issues as they were like, because um, they were writing in uh, some word-like program and just marking up people's names manually, so if they didn't mark up the whole name in bold, sometimes the colon was in bold, sometimes it wasn't, depending on, <laughs> depending on how they selected it, um, so it was just the, the past obviously kept breaking and rather than make our code more and more complicated over time, um, we, we added like a little patcher program so we could fix the source HTML at our end and then that would uh, get it on our website quicker. Um, and one advantage to doing that is once it's in a database, databases are like computers and can run things for you automatically and run checks. Um, so one morning we had to, I had an email from the parser that just said there was a mistake, that it couldn't pass the list of people voting in the division. And so I was like, okay, well that's, that, that happens all the time, there's probably a mistake, um, so we, our code is fragile um, so I had a look and it was like it was perfect the, the HTML the code was perfectly fine um, but it was the name of someone who wasn't an MP because it was someone who died the week before um, but they'd been listed as having voted in Parliament um, so we were like oh we, we, we checked uh, so we just emailed Parliament to go um, I think I think they probably didn't vote um, could you could you check and they were like oh thank you very much because obviously there was nothing automated at their end they, they obviously have a lot of work to do getting it into existence at all um, so um, but those things are sort of changing over time um, and as I said part of our aim is to hopefully show how things could be um, improved and better and so um, we can hardly complain if that then happens even if it creates a massive amount of work for us um, so Parliament have relaunched their website in the time that um, they have been running uh, which completely then broke our parser entirely um, we do have access now to sort of the underlying XML that Parliament uses to produce the website, which meant we still had to produce a new parser, but hopefully one that might be slightly more stable until they decide to move to a new publishing platform, which again, they're perfectly within their rights to do, but obviously can cause a lot of work, could cause a lot of work to us. Um, and even then, there's still, it's still a manual process at their end, obviously, uh, which can lead to it. Only last week, um, our parser got confused because is a bold tag inside a member tag, or is a member tag inside a bold tag? It, either way, it can happen. <laughs> um, and things they have to deal with, they, they have to deal with a um, last minute change as well. Um, proxy support was added after a lot of discussion, um, was added to Hansard uh, to Parliament, the UK Parliament, at very short notice recently after an MP uh, delayed their caesarean in order to vote. Um, and so Hansard had to obviously very quickly as well deal with that and put it in, um, in Hansard in some way for the very next day to be published that morning. So then our party was like, I don't understand what this line means. And so we have to then adapt that quickly enough to get it on our site, so whew. Um, but I think it's worth it in the end. Um, one more thing is they, the IDs that Parliament use in the XML that we use, um, it turns out aren't per person as we would like, they're per role, um, so when the Bishop of Birmingham retires and there's a new Bishop of Birmingham, uh, the ID gets reused, when there's a new Marcus of Chumley, uh, it replaces the old Marcus of Chumley. I, I will, don't talk to me about why um, the United Kingdom has unelected hereditaries and bishops in the House of Lords or in the legislature, but um, they do. Like, uh, um, so recently, in a, re in a reverse situation of the dead um, MP voting, we recently, for a brief period, they were a few said a dead Lord had voted, um, which was our fault because we reused the old ID by mistake. So there's obviously all maintenance of um, uh, making sure that things are accurate and up to date. Um, the Scottish Parliament, uh, which they if you also covers, um, we've had whole years, uh, like 2011 to 2013, we just stopped updating the Scottish Parliament when they were a few because they changed their website and we just didn't have the resources to um, get it working again. Uh, eventually, after another change they made, 
they agree, we, we, we changed our password a bit, but they agreed to republish, keep publishing it in the old format for us, which was nice of them. Um, so things can break on their own, and things can break when external things change, and then there's things that don't break, but just go, um, oh, one button. Things can go out of date if you, um, if you just um, leave things, they just sort of go out of date. So um, uh, they work for you, have voting policies where we say um, uh, how MPs are voted and sort of try and group them into categories um, and describe some votes and that requires manual work uh, to keep up to date and to just do it. Um, what do they know? Our Freedom of Information site has to keep a list of who you can contact, uh, the, all the bodies, um, which requires manual, uh, manual work by volunteers. Um, and representative details have to be kept up to date. They obviously change a lot of election time, but between elections um, and so on. And again, um, a manual process. We, we did some work with the Wikidata um, and, and Facebook last year to for get things into Wikidata for national politicians and stuff. And hopefully that will help keep things up to date. But obviously there's right to them has local level as well, where there's many thousands of politicians to, um, to keep up to date. Um, elections um, back in 2005, for updating all they were for you. I happened for my old job to be in Canada um, on the day of the UK general election, which meant the time zone difference meant that I could update they were for you during my day um, when it was overnight back in the UK, which was very handy as the results came in of the general election. But um, more recently, I've not had that um, luxury. Um, but we've there've been more people who have um, popped up, like Democracy Club and um, um, my mind's blanked. Um, your next MP. Um, which is um, which is making a big community of things of, of people to help um, maintain this all, the, all this data, um, and the last one, which is the one I'm sort of involved in a lot, is boundary data, which comes up a lot in um, in civic technology. Um, whilst I know Brexit might be getting most of the coverage at the moment, a few days later on April Fool's Day, I don't know why they've picked um, that, but. Uh, <laughs> um, there's some big boundary changes happening in local government in England. Oh, um, some councils are merging, um, like all of Dorset is a, becoming a, a is Dorset is split into two levels of council, but they're all merging into one big council on the 1st of April. Um, whew, I know, um, big news. Um, and some other Somerset and Western Taunton are merging together. Um, but obviously for that we need the new boundary data um, in order to for fix my street to keep sending reports to the say to the right place and for right to them to have the new uh, representatives the elections for these new councils aren't until may um, so there's a month period where no one's really sure who your councillor is going to be um, i think we're just going to maybe turn the site off for a month that's my uh, easy preference <laughs> um but um but yeah we'll, we'll see if anyone notices or complains but um yeah but there's elections in may for those new councils that come into existence on the first of april so um i thought maybe they could do it the other way around it might be make more sense I'll, I'll suggest it for next time um so but yeah this is the so the uk is um is in terms of releasing boundary data uh, quite advanced now it's, it's open data uh, if you're lucky you get it in advance of the elections um, so that's good. Um, so some, getting the data that you need for other countries is uh, definitely, we, we had a lot of, for the Democratic Commons wiki data work we did, we had a lot of problems find, just finding boundary data in, in some countries and stuff. Um, so I've done a lot of technical stuff there, but I must also mention the elephant or the dodo in the room, um, which is funding. Um, and quite often uh, people um, and organisations seem to want to fund new, shiny um, things. Um, quite often, like you see a lot of uh, people um, asking for submissions for new projects and ideas, and are, and are less less likely to fund um, to keep things going. So my site is actually been very lucky in um, getting um, unrestricted funding and, um, and ongoing maintenance funding a lot over the years. But um, uh, I, I hopefully that can continue. I don't, I, 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 no, um, and stuff, but that could definitely be a big, a big problem for people to um, get the funding. If, it, like, you know, if it's set up as a volunteer thing, like as Isabel was mentioning, mm -hmm. and you know, if you're just reliant on volunteers, people have got lives and might not have the time. If you want to be able to sustain, to do it sustainably, you uh, have to find money. So I always say what um, my society does uh, quite a bit is to sort of run commercial services to help fund the, uh, the charitable work. So um, I work quite a lot on Fix My Street, uh, which we sort of work with. Uh, UK councils and um, to uh, help integrate better with their back-end services um, and provide um, 
like their reporting tool, like a sort of a, a, a version of Fixed My Street for them um, to provide help provide funding for the, the charitable work. Um, also, we did some work with Channel 4, a uh, UK broadcaster a few years ago. They were doing a TV series about um, empty homes in Britain and the scandal of them not being uh, put into use, uh, which was quite a sort of um, charitable thing. Um, we worked with them to make a Fixed My Street style reporting tool for reporting empty homes in your local authority. Um, which not only was um, provided funding, but also um, gave us the ability to add Northern Ireland to uh, Fix My Street, which had been uh, lacking until then. Um, that, that gave us the resource to do that, so that was really good. Um, another one more issue that can arise is um, our sites have been around now for so long that people can start to assume they're just part of the furniture. Uh, like the Cheshire Cat, we just sort of fade until we're just, just the, the grin is left as we are. And we have to continue. Um, people don't sort of realise. So when they were for you was set up in 2004, it, um, we took the copy of Hansard from the official website um, without permission. Um, parliamentary copyright at the time didn't allow you to take copies, um, but we thought that you should be able to. Um, <laughs> so, so, so we did. It's, it's probably probably bad PR if anyone said tried to do anything about it really. Um, and now obviously everything's lovely of the Open Parliament licence and that's brilliant and great. Um, I, I don't know if we were sort of a little push hopefully in that direction along with many others. Um, but nowadays obviously yeah, everyone's like they would use like it's just this thing that everyone like uses to check what the, how their MP voted and stuff and people don't think about the, the people that are behind it, the small sort of um, the team. It's not like a government run a ginormous official body. Um, Recently, the BBC drama Bodyguard, I don't know if anyone watched that, but um, they, um, at the beginning, the uh, bodyguard becomes bodyguard for the new Home Secretary, and he goes home and he Googles them, and, he, and they mocked up a They Work For You um, copy, a copy of They Work For You with the, with the, with the Home Secretary on, so they could, she, he could look up, uh, rather than the official Parliament website. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, yeah, okay, so yeah, that's, that's good. Um, but also, yeah, so, um, and what do they know, um, freedom of information, um, because the government, in some cases, are not that big a fan of freedom of information, um, so they can try and come, try to uh, push back and um, try to. Um, uh, they, they, at one time, they tried to introduce limitations um, to the to, to an FOI law, which are thankfully all rebuffed. But you've got to again, you've got to be vigilant, which requires effort um, uh, on people's parts. Um, then, of course, there's the sad issue of. Um, if you can't maintain everything to the level you might want to, um, to keep it useful and functional, you have to make the hard decision to shut things down. Um, or something happens that what you do is now no longer necessary. Um, so examples we have, so Pledge Bank, uh, which I mentioned at the start, was a collective action website where people could like say, I will do something, but only if other people will help me do it. Um, which had some successes like helping set up the Open Rights Group um, and some charitable things, but it was, um, it predated Kickstarter, Unbound group on all of them, but it wasn't really. It didn't have the resources, uh, the scale, or the commerciality really to um, to be taken further. Um, especially with the the idea that I mentioned that we thought that things should try and be as self-sustaining as possible. Um, maybe in a looking glass world, we'd, we'd now be all a uh, group on like millionaires or something. But, um, Here for MP was, as I said, a constituency-based mailing list. Um, and at the time, many, email was very novel to quite a lot of MPs. But nowadays, obviously, people have got too many ways of um, being in touch, uh, with, and their representatives, vice versa, can get in touch very easily with, with the people they want, they want to. So um, we thought it was no longer a service we, we needed to run. And then lastly, the uh, petition site that we ran, as I said, um, the government took that in-house after the 2010 election. Um, it became an official thing with Parliament, and now if you get enough signatures, they will debate it in Parliament, uh, which is great to see. Um, and especially I don't have to do any user support for it anymore, so that's a, a very, very a great thing from my point of view. Um, and so the last thing I'm going to cover um, is if your service become more popular, uh, things you might want to like think about foresee, like remember forwards, uh, the White Queen was a, as the White Queen says, a, only, it's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards. Um, first, of course, if you're popular and you get more users, um, speaking selfishly, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, because more, especially, I should, I should clarify, especially if they're not paying. If you get more users and, and each one of them is paying you for whatever the service, that, that's generally a good thing, I believe. Um, but for like a lot of charitable free services, more users generally means uh, more user support, 
more technical issues, need more storage space needed. Uh, even we find more enticing to spammers. Um, like our websites are popular enough now that you get spammers trying to like use them to like contact your users um, through like the in-site messaging service and stuff with like link spam and stuff, which you then have to try and deal with more maintenance, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, for fix my street, um, growing more popular led to a lot of still leads to like lots of UX issues um, as we get more and more reports showing them on the map in a way that's not confusing but still provides overview and stuff. Um, lots of things to think about there or making report creation easier when you've got um, so many like 12 years of reports in the system now. Um, and then lastly we spent quite some time making Fix My Street um, and Alavatelli, the what do they know code base, um, customizable and installable um, and it is now installed in many places around the world, um, both of them. But that obviously leads to more um, support too, both from the people who reused it, um, needing help with stuff, which is great, um, but also writing your code from then on in such a way that it is easily like, they can do their own thing, but still you, you're doing your thing. Um, so it's sort of like a being able to have the things working together, which is a, a good problem to have, but it's not something we did at the start because we didn't know that would be where we'd be going with Fix My Street. Um, but it's something to think about, like if you think you might be reusing then to um, consider how what you're doing can be made gen more generic enough that it can be customizable by people for different uses. Um, I hope that was an interesting insight into the history and uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>
and uh, one of the ministers basically said we had to take down the study because it's like against the copyright issue because it was done by a ministry. So basically we are reviewing it to take it down so it goes into the court and actually then it will be like uh, thought out like is it actually makes sense which we think it's completely BS uh, to have uh, that angle that you can take require to take down a study from the government. Uh, so that's basically in a nutshell what Open Knowledge Foundation Germany is doing. What I always say is like we're helping Germany moving from painful manual data operations, where this big, uh, beautiful analogy was like with uh, container shipping to automate such uh, rollout on data structure. Once you have open data, open source, and standards, and we do that in different variations. A beautiful project is Opal, which basically is like a standard on how you get data out from the civic hall all over Germany in like one format so you can also create the tools. And one project last year was the so-called Open Schufa project. So in order to start it, we did in the beginning uh, in February 2019 a fundraising campaign where we a, got uh, around 40,000 euro uh, to create in, like this platform where people can send in data. And we were blessed with having Schufa as an opponent because they really were stupid. Uh, in the sense that in the beginning of the campaign, they had like for two weeks on the front main page a uh, disclaimer what Open Schufa is. And we were like, yes, that's great. Because now everybody knows actually what we're doing. And also that they overstretched it. So they're basically saying our campaign is causing a, a economic uh, male function in Germany that even like everybody who could think straight was like, that's like way above uh, the line. So that helped a lot for the momentum. And the campaign itself targeted like, so you can get as an individual uh, the Shufa score. They will send it back to you uh, home via mail. And uh, what we did at that part, so first we encouraged people to request their individual score, that they get it. And then we created a platform where they actually can upload their unique score uh, to our platform with different levels of privacy. Since we're talking about Germany and privacy is like a big deal there, and it's basically like your financial history, uh, it was a big problem from the campaign because a lot of like consumer rights organizations basically backed off and said like we were following like how it will work out because it's like too much risk for the campaign for them to be associated with. So that's what we did and uh, we had another partner which allowed us to like managing like this whole request process to make sure the fax is sent over there, you have your ID there and uh, making sure to track it when it's done. It's similar like what we do with uh, Fraktenstadt, the Freedom of Information portal. And on that portal, we just had like 30,000 unique requests just for Schufa. So there are other companies out there who are doing worse credit scoring in Germany. The problem is they're like not that known and Schufa is their household brand name for the stuff. And that's what you get back. So you have like a different scores. Uh, Basically, when you, for example, want to have a mobile phone, you get one score. If you want to have a new bank account, you get a different score and they're like parameters. So basically, it goes up to 100 in theory. So 99 point something is really great. If you're like below 95, you're like really have a shitty score. And that is basically depending then if you get a rent uh, for an apartment or not. And what we see here, that was the long list in the beginning. And that's the short list after the GDPR actually kicked in on May 25th. So that was one of the big issues that in Germany you have a, like a regulatory authority who should take care of like uh, how the data is in there. And since then we only get like that less information which makes the reversing from the crowdsourced data more complicated. Uh, at the current state is it that this should get back to the state before and we are pushing for it but it's like Schufa so it's like a little bit tricky. So all together we had like 100,000 data uh, requests. Uh, 30,000 for Schufa, the other one were like for other credit scoring agencies and from that 30,000 we got then actually 3,000 back which were like usable and out of this data set we did then like as much as we could do reverse engineering as you say like trying to calculate how this score actually works. Uh, the problem here was also that we have a bias in the data so we have like urban male young people it's like a big bias. Uh, and what happened there, Schufa in the summer basically uh, threatened this journalist that he was uh, providing fake news. So that was really great because the whole campaign we dominated almost like twice in the evening in the completely news cycle once we launched the campaign and once we uh, had then the results at the end of November. And that was thanked to Schufa because it's like really not really liked in Germany. 
and they're not really up to like how to handle crisis PR. And so this is, for example, what we had in like from the data sets back. Here you can say like where's the range of your score. And what is clear if you, for example, were an insolvency or you have an execution proceeding, that your score is like from here from 100, like somewhere really below. That's okay, you can discuss about it if it's like just and what is the whole thing with when you rate some person. What we are looking at it, it, it like where is actually wrong data or bad data. And we found the like four areas. So we had one thing was like people with no negative data had a bad score. So we had 20 people who had like perfect like data set, but they got like a negative score, which means like if they want to get a credit or a loan for a house, they pay more. And giving the size from our sample, uh, put up to the population of Germany, it's like a hundred thousand people are affected by some like weird uh, data limbo. Uh, another thing was that uh, you Schufa is pretending to have a perfect detailed score, although sometimes uh, for the majority only have like three or less data points. And then they're pretending to when you saw the numbers before that it's 99.95 or 99.90 and that little thingy actually makes a huge of difference. Uh, but there's no data for that to back that up. Uh, another one was like they have different versions of the score going back to 2001 till like uh, the latest one is 2011 and depending who is using what score, which bank, you sometimes uh, get a different uh, outcome. And it's like you have to understand the problem here is like companies collecting some data, then they use that data to bring it to Schufa. Schufa is calculating like the score and then a third company is using that score to make a decision. And the thing is always then like saying, like when you say there's something wrong in this data chain, somebody says, well, it's not my fault because I was not collecting the data. The other one is like saying, I, I just calculated, but uh, didn't make the decision. And the thing is like how to break it up and find like who is responsible because if there are like a lot of individual cases when people try to fix that thing that like everybody's blaming the other ones. And there's no pressure on it like to fix that. So another one was like where you could argue is like there's a bias on age, gender, and how many times you moved. And for example, at how many times you moved, it's in their series, like the more you move, the more problems you have. But some people have to move because of the job. And they get a penalty because they're moving from X, Y, Z to X, Y, B because of uh, their like in whatever trace or stuff like that. And you can't clean that up like proactively. You don't even know that something is happening. And if you want to know it, like one, once a year you can ask for free. And otherwise you have to pay to get the information, what they have over you, where they sell that data. And that's like, there was for us the whole automation to move that on. And that's my favorite one. So from our data sample, what we figured out is the perfect setup for you to get a higher credit score is uh, you need that's the number of credit cards, that's the number of uh, bank accounts, and then it's the number of mobile contracts. And finally, it's always like if you have two credit cards, two bank accounts, and two mobile contracts, your calculation is higher. Oh. <laughs> and there's sometimes a weird logic behind it. Uh, some people actually thought that the, the banking account is weird because if you're happy with one bank, why you need a second one? Uh, but there's a bias towards like what some maturity is doing that's then considered to be uh, the best case. So uh, on the impact side, uh, at the end of uh, October, the German uh, Ministry from um, uh, Consumer Protection and uh, Lawmaking uh, gave out the report uh, publication and we were mentioned then and it also like framed the whole debate and then like you had for automated uh, decision making what needs to be done, that the criteria should be there, and you also can uh, re-verify the input variables. Uh, at the end of November then, we had uh, the big launch on, with our media partners, uh, Bayerische Rundfunk and Spiegel Online, on the results. And again, the hilarious part was Schufa basically like got asked for a statement, and then they put down a nine-pager, and disclaiming like you can't cite out of the nine-pager. So that actually helped us a lot because everybody knew like why you're writing even nine pages when it's not available to the public. Uh, so this is a German minister of Bale who uh, after the campaign also uh, pointed out that something has to be done, especially like uh, the authorities monitoring Schufa have to step forward. 
Uh, that was from uh, the account on when the presentation was. So it's uh, transparency, authorities, and you, uh, the consumer should know uh, what the criteria are for uh, the exact measurement. This will be like a long-term project over the next years to figure that out, how that will be done, uh, because there's a lot of pressure on it, and Open Shuva, it's not bad at uh, lobbying on that area, and basically uh, calling a lot of, like for example, journalists up, and when they do reporting, to make sure it's like onto their line. Uh, and that was promised for the beginning of 2019 that we, from the paperwork, when they send a snail mail, uh, actually will uh, provide uh, electronic data. Uh, we are still waiting for it. And uh, that was just from my quick presentation. And we always say Shufa is the beginning, not the end. We know that like other credit scoring agencies in Germany out there. Uh, we also like uh, know that in Poland now, this is a topic. And uh, when you think it's like in the long term view, I mean, that stuff will not stop just by credit scoring when you look, for example, towards China, we have automated decision making on like a human level. And I think this is like why we chose that project was because we had it in the pipeline for years, but you sometimes need to wait when the time is right. And also this is one of the few examples from our point of view where people actually understand what that scoring means in reality. Because otherwise this is like really dry, boring data thing to explain and nobody's like, who cares, right? But giving the great reputation of Schumer in Germany, <laughs> it was a self-running project. Yeah. So if you have any questions, uh, please let me know and the slides are online. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. That was absolutely fascinating. I'd love to see the same thing on credit scores um, in the UK. Um, if you could just join me in thanking all our speakers for their talks and their excellent timing. Uh, the next session starts in 20 minutes and we're not going to have a break so if you will do 10 minutes for questions if everybody's happy with that and you'll have 10 minutes to grab a coffee and a pastry and move make to the next session and everybody happy to do questions um, you had one yourself there both your talks uh, resonate a lot uh, with me uh, and uh, with uh, Robert Citoyen, which is uh, uh, pretty much uh, the French My Society uh, that uh, exists since 2009. And uh, we have a very similar uh, uh, mechanism of uh, way of functioning as uh, you do, uh, except we, we are a legal entity. Uh, we mm -hmm. ended up uh, creating a, a real association. And, uh, but otherwise, we are very uh, horizontal and uh, trying uh, the same to anybody uh, participate uh, on uh, only volunteer uh, work, uh, which is uh, the resignation with uh, Matthew as uh, we're running uh, like a, a parliamentary monitoring website as well, and uh, it's, we have the same issues. So I'll come back to my question for you just after. But so, uh, first Isabel, I was wondering, mm -hmm. uh, since you have no legal entity, how do you handle uh, the things, like we have material things? Like yeah, we have an Open Cultural Foundation. Sorry? Um, we have an um, Open Cultural Foundation, mm -hmm. which is uh, um, organized by um, different uh, communities in Taiwan, because we, we have very strong civic society. So uh, there are many different open source communities, and they held an event every year. So they decide, the people from different communities decide to um, create uh, this Open Cultural Foundation, and he becomes the umbrella foundation, and he handles the logistic and the money things. And the, but it's not our only choice. We can choose another one. Just uh, every task force, they can choose an other entities to cooperate. Yeah, that's what we do it so, for yes, the moment. So the names, uh, like uh, I don't know, uh, bank accounts, uh, administration. How do you handle like administrators of uh, platforms? Uh, uh, basically, it's a volunteer. It's a run by volunteers. Yeah. So just like Joe Song, we raise money, and uh, if go into the Open Cultural Foundation's uh, uh, account, but we just uh, try to make a, a agreement with uh, uh, between individuals and uh, the foundation, and to arrange things. And, and Matthew, I was wondering uh, when you talked about uh, scraping and uh, the things that 
the source is manual, and so when you work with it, you always have some new problems that arise and that you have to fix them. Uh, I was wondering what kind of process uh, did you set up to, to facilitate this and to let other developers uh, contribute to it? This, this is a problem we have. Is that basically, there's a technology debt, and there's only like two people that can actually uh, work on the scrapers and uh, know what to check. And, uh, so we, we have like scripts that analyze the result of the parsing and take a look at it, but we have some manual uh, uh, human reading of uh, outputs to just try to find potential errors. And so I was wondering if you had some really good uh, No, we were the same. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, I'm afraid, yeah. Um, yeah, we tried to um, spread it around to other people as they joined the team or whatever, but yeah, but it fundamentally was a, it is, is an issue, but less so now, thankfully, but was in the past. And your exchange with the parliament, uh, are they contrib I mean, uh, constructive? Do they uh, yeah, um, fix problems? And, uh, yes, yeah, like sometimes like, yeah, if, it, if, it, if we spotted like a, a mistake, we, yeah, we let them know and they would then fix it, and then that would automatically then feed back, so yeah. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, very interesting to hear about the credit agency story. I was wondering, um, I, I know that this type of projects are really necessary to improve the accountability of these uh, agencies, um, but maybe this is naive, uh, just checking. Did they have some kind of um, mechanism in place to uh, object against a, a credit decision or um, uh, get a little transparency into the data, or was there really nothing in place? So how it went before, there was like a you have like real big problems like once you get declined for something, yeah. you can make sure that they cleaned up some of the data. We had cases where it takes like six months plus if you're really like going for it. Yeah. Uh, then can happen that the score is uh, cleared on an individual base, uh, but for example, uh, there's no real way you can go there. You have like no tools, like for example, getting like uh, the damage you had gotten through it for not getting a rent in Berlin, which is difficult at the moment. And there's not even like that. It's uh, the first step, but we would say that you as a, being part of like this credit scoring, at least you can get an access page where you can log in and you can say, what is like my score and for example if it should change you can look what is causing it because a lot of things you have like uh, with identity mismatch so you have like one person with the same name and another person got the wrong entry uh, just to figure that then out takes some time but sometimes you don't know it if you're for example not even aware of it that it's a happening b that for example your employer looks up the scoring uh, and uh, if you have like uh, which sometimes can happen of being your credit card being paid or getting like a really bad mark that, that can affect like uh, your promotion to the job. Right. So the, and there's the one thing with uh, GDPR, according to our understanding from the GDPR, that should be absolutely the necessity and also like a legal base that I as an individual can require that data. Uh, and I think that's like uh, being uh, overseen by a German uh, the authorities who should be controlling Schufa. I mean, that's like a political thing because they're located in one part of Germany, and especially normally in Germany, have like a, a really some states have like enforced data protection. Yeah. Uh, that one doesn't have the high reputation of being like really going after them. Uh, it's also like one of the things was a there was a study on uh, Schufa how they handled it, and that study actually was paid by Schufa and stuff like that. Well, on this uh, consumer uh, protection board, uh, there are people who work then on another angle for Schufa. So it's, it's a thing, uh, a lot of, uh, I think, a political question. At least it's our approach is like to raise the awareness. And uh, I think we had some really nice impact on uh, this one ministry because it was aligned perfectly in being Schufa, being Schufa really helped like building the momentum of the campaign. Because they could have like almost like, um, my point of view, like they could have like put it asleep in the beginning to say like, well, let's meet and make, make uh, <laughs> a workshop on it, right, for the next two years and uh, let's be you know, but the other ones are even worse. Being Schufa, that helped a lot. And so uh, we really hope that this is uh, continuing and there will be actually some uh, 
stuff happening in the near future. And the, the, the bias in gender and age, how did that work? Well, you have, for example, uh, bias. Uh, if you're young, your credit score is uh, worse than if you're older. If you're male, it's actually worse than if you're female. And the uh, mm. same is with the numbers of moving. So the question would be, is, there, is that justified because your age and your gender you clearly can't choose? Uh, they will, of course, say that like, this is backed up by data. It's the same discussion what you have is uh, in uh, driving insurance and young male who clearly make more accidents. Yeah, we'll have time for one more, one more question. Just, very quickly about, just following on from that a little bit with um, the actual selection of people who, who volunteer to help you with getting all of their shoe were they Were they representative of a sort of cross-section of, of people living in Germany or were they a bit more like the people in this conference? Were they more sort of civic tech people or were they it's like uh, that there's a huge bias towards a uh, young male IT related and urban. Uh, we try to make uh, corporations with uh, local newspapers so we reach a uh, different, completely different audience. Um, we fail at that point. Uh, it has to do something, the process, I mean, you have to understand, you have to sign up asking for the data, they send it by mail, then we making as slick as possible effort at like sending the data up but then it's also like Germany where especially older people have like a huge uh, concerns about uh, privacy which in the one part is interesting and the other part we got like literally like unblack copies <laughs> from their score because they were so pissed and I've never seen anything like that how many people were like really mad about one company and that also show, have shown, like, for example, other reports, which uh, was then uh, from the campaign report. We have different news outlets bringing uh, clear cases of like a retired person having problems because of why uh, some Goldman Sachs person moving to Germany didn't get a credit score, although he was like really rich. And stuff like that to make it clear that there's a uh, systemic problem in how the data gets together. and. Uh, Making this like data value chain more transparent. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.